بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها المدثر قم فأنذر وربك فكبر وثيابك فطهر والرجز فهجر من الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله في نعمه يكافي مزيدا يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحسي فناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك فلك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضا اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في كل وقت وحين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد في الملل على إلى يوم الدين وصل وسلم على سيدنا محمد حتى تلك الأرض ومن عليها وأنت خير وارثين نوي تتعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكير نفع انتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسك بكتاب الله بسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وش الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى ونويت ما نوى مشايخنا من صالح النيات أن الله تعالى يجعلنا من علماء العاملين الفائزين في عمي يكين عين يخين حقي بلطف وعافية طيب إن شاء الله in our last session I think we looked at the final the beginning of this um, section of the thematic look at the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallama knowledge of his seerah being one of the prerequisites for the embodiment of his Lord Jalla fil ula that's what one of the imams of the Shema'il makes mention of that in order for us to become of those who adhere to the Lord of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallama he said that the respect that you hold for the law is always proportional to the respect that you hold for the one who brought the law i.e. the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallama and respect for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama is predicated upon the knowledge of the Messenger himself sallallahu alayhi wa sahihi wa sallama and although we are all born ignorant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama some are more ignorant than others so part of our journey in life inshallah ta'ala part of our journey in life is to become people who are, have a greater awareness and knowledge of who the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa alayhi wa is and that is a lifetime endeavor okay there's no point at which we say that we have sufficient knowledge of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he's the one who said la ya'arufuni illallah that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows me and he's the one who also says sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam kuntu nabiyan wa adam munjadilan vitinatihi that I was a prophet whilst Adam was still intermingled in clay form and that is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahi wa sallama prior in the world of spirits for here what we engage in seerah is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallama and his prophecy as experienced inside of the world and that's what the final call ultimately looks at we mentioned that there are two key stages in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life post 40 the first is at 40 years of age as in the hadith that was related by Imam um, al-Bukhari with the Prophet sallallahu wa sallam saying Anas said ba'athahu Allahu ala ra'si arba'ina sana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him prophecy ba'athahu either ba'atha here is what is prophecy is granted prophecy ala ra'si arba'ina sana on his 40th birthday sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam so that is prophecy but the nature of prophecy as we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who according to the, to the imams of the religion has sent a great number of prophets the minimum number that has been mentioned is 124,000 prophets were sent to planet earth that's in the hadith of Sayyidina Abu Dhar al-Ghifari although the traditions mention 224,000 and then the ulama are upon the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mudathir لَا يَعْلُمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُ that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the number of his soldiers number of his soldiers from the angelic realm i.e. the angels but that's the vastest sort of creation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created are the angels but likewise his soldiers i.e. from the prophets the prophets we define prophets as those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uhiya ilayhi bi shara Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inspired or revealed unto them through the intermediary of a namus the, who is J Gabriel, the bearer of the heavenly secret, the Namus al-Akbar, the supreme holder of the heavenly secret. And he's revealed unto them a shara, which is a law. وَلَمْ يُؤْمَرْ بِتَبْلِيغِهِ But they are not commanded to convey that law. So that 124,000, 224,000 and counting individuals known as prophets, NBA, al-NBA, 
They are not commanded to convey the law which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed unto them. Although they are commanded with two things, the first and foremost is they must convey unto their communities that they are prophets. So the people of those societies afford them their due respect. You see, these are elite beings. And then the second thing they're commanded with is to embody the law, that which has been revealed unto them. And that obviously tells us a lot about ancient society, societies that embrace prophets but never embrace messenger prophets, in that it would be a clear indication that people in those societies, that it was the deed that was more profound than the word. That when they see people who they understood were prophets, elite beings, who embodied or walked a specific walk, that was sufficient for them to what to follow the path with those, which those beings came with. I they never need to they never needed to speak about it or to teach the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that sense. That's how we understand prophets. Higher than them are the elite messengers, what are called the Rusul, okay, the Mursaleen. These are the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like prophets, because they also are prophets, has inspired and revealed unto them the shara, the law. But they have been commanded to convey. So they convey by the word just as they convey by the deed, by virtue of their prophecy. They elite, they're 313 individuals, 313 individuals, the Rusul. In the Quran, as well as by extension in the Sunnah, only 25 of them have been named, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us, of those, there are those we have made mention to you, and there are those we have not made mention to you. Yeah, okay, we've kept their names hidden, okay? And here it means the conveyance I unto the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they are the Rusul, 313, the same number of the elite people of Badr, the Sahaba, 313, the same number that crossed the river with Talut in the great occasion of David when his Prophet Dawood alayhi salam went against Goliath, a very sort of noble number with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For amongst the 313 or 25 elite who are mentioned, and for amongst them 25 are the five elite who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Ulul Azmi min al Rusul. He calls them Ulul Azmi, the prophets of determination or resolve. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the elite Prophet, the elect sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Al Mustafa. After him comes Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. After him comes Sayyidina Musa, Moses alayhi salam. After him comes Sayyidina Isa, Jesus alayhi salam. And after him comes Prophet Nuh, Noah alayhi salam. They are the five elite beings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. Right now we study the elite one, the elect one. And by virtue of that word, an elect ummah kuntu khayra ummah ukhrijat linnas. That you are the word, the best nation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought or forth for humanity. Imam al Busayri radiallahu ta'ala an, he said by virtue of the fact that your prophet is the elite, the elect prophet, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahihi wa sallam. That's what renders us elect. And when we to study the Quran in depth, then we would understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rendered all of those other elect beings, whether it's the other four from the prophets of resolve, the messengers of resolve, or the 25, or the 313, or the 224,000 and counting, that their election to the degree where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elected them as prophets and chosen was by virtue of the great prophet himself, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahihi wa sallam. As we sort of alluded to in the beginning of our thematic look, that is what the mithaq al nabiyin is, the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took with every single prophet yani for prophecy over the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you will believe in him and you will grant him victory when he manifests. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the Sahih law, كَانَ مُوسَى ibn Imran مَا وَسِعَهُ If Moses, the son of Imran, was alive, he would have no option but to follow me. Why? Because he took a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that his prophecy was granted on the basis of that. And that is why you also likewise see inside of the Qur'an of Allah Jalla fil Ula that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he mentions the prophets, he mentions them in two ways. He either mentions them as prophets or he mentions them bi asma'ihim al mujarrada or he mentions them just by their name. And what we see inside of the Qur'an is never is a prophet mentioned as a prophet, called a prophet by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that the Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in the same sentence. And whenever the Prophet Muhammad is not mentioned in the same sentence, then Allah Ta'ala doesn't call them prophets. 
Ya Yahya Khudil Kitabi Kawa. Oh Yahya, take the book with what strength? He doesn't call him Prophet Yahya, he just calls him Yahya. But whenever what the Prophet Sallallahu is mentioned, then prophecy is attributed to all of the other great 25 inside of the Quran. Okay, this is the messenger we study, inshallah ta'ala. And what we have to understand that this is the culmination of since what? The beginning of man, of 224,000 elite beings calling through deed and 313 calling through word and deed. This is where it all ends with the final messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who sent with the universal message that is going to what usher in the final period in what? In the, in the multiple epochs of humanity. Yes, that they ask you about the final moment, and the sa'ah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Anta in dhikraha, that you are from its signs, from the realities of it, and the Prophet sallallahu said, Ana wa sa'ah kahatain. He said, Me and the final moment are like this. I, with his appearance, it ushers in the final epoch of humanity, which we are in the midst of. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for safety and security inside of our lives and beyond Jalla fil ula So we also made mention, I have come unto you to take you from the worship of slaves unto the worship of the Lord of slaves, and from the narrowness of the world unto the vastness of the world and the hereafter. And that in a sense it summarizes the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu They're the words of the great Sahaba whose name is Rabi'i ibn Amir radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was the one who was sent unto Kisra, unto Khasros. Okay, and he's the one who enters upon Khasros and he embarrasses Khasros and all of the what the elite ministers of Khasros. This one who comes out of the desert and he's using a harba, he's using a spear as a walking stick. And he, as he enters into the great sort of Diwan, the great palace of Khasros, palaces that were built for one purpose only. And if anyone who studies the ancient Persian Empire, they were only built just to house the throne. That's all that was in there, the throne of the king of Khasros, which the throne was this long sort of a, what we'd consider like a couch more than a throne. And when Rabbi Ibn Amr enters upon it, he's using his harba, his, what, his spear as a walking stick, and he begins to scratch all of the what? The expensive tilings of what? Of the palace of Khasros. And then he walks right up to Khasros and he sits beside Khasros upon the throne of Khasros. An illusion that the war, that the Nawab of the Prophet Sallallahu i.e. those representatives of the Prophet Sallallahu their time is near for them to what to upseat the actual war rule of a very, very tyrannical dynasty. And he says, what is it that you came with? And these are the words he utters, radiallahu ta'ala, which gives us a sense of what the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the universal prophecy and messengership is about. Jittukum li ukhrijukum min ibadat al ibadi ila ibadati rabb al ibad. He says, I have came unto you to take you from the worship of slaves unto the worship of the Lord of slaves. Wa min diqi dunya ila si'ati dunya wa la akhira. And from the narrowness of the world unto the vastness of the world and the hereafter. That's the deen. And that's the purpose of the callers, those who summon unto the way of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, as he's instructed inside of the Quran, Qul, هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةً تَبَعَانِي He says, say, Allah Ta'ala is instructing the Prophet wasallam, this is my way. I call or I summon unto God, unto Allah Ta'ala, ala basira, with penetrating insight, ana, I, wa man ittaba'ani, and those who adhere to my path, those who follow me. These are the representatives. And the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, anhum, just as it's important for us to have knowledge of the Messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's also extremely, extremely important that that knowledge is extended to his companions. Because in the companions, we see aspects of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. They are the face mirrors that reflected his reality. So in our ignorance of the companions, we are ultimately ignorant of who the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is. Okay, we mentioned the four stages. I think this is where we left off in our last sessions. And we said that the mission of the Prophet ﷺ is going to be divided into four stages. The discrete stage, I the discrete stage is the stage of prophecy. I with the Prophet is not calling unto the religion of Islam. 
He's not teaching the religion as a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why we see uniquely that the people who teach religion at that point in time are the companions, especially the great Siddiq, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. We made mention that over five of the people who are guaranteed paradise, the elite ten, that they all become Muslim at the hands of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in the discrete stage. Okay, so what's notable when we just study Sira with a discerning eye, we see that the Prophet ﷺ is not teaching. You see, but it's his mirrors, the likes of a Siddiq al-Akbar, Abu Bakr ta'ala are the ones who are speaking about the religion, albeit in a very discreet and quote-unquote covert manner. And one of the most important things we draw from this, but it's thematic, we don't look at it, is that there are certain people in the midst of all of that stuff, that kufr, that there are certain people who are primordial, aboriginal, pure-hearted people who have a receptivity to truth and they shun evil, they shun anything that contravenes that truth. And they were the types of people who Abu Bakr and sought out. He was not seeking out people who were taken to the dominant way, the dominant culture of Mecca, but he was seeking people who had already shown some type of disdain for what? For that which was what dominant inside of that society. That is a discrete state. <coughs> and we say, meanwhile, the Prophet ﷺ is busy with higher things. And what is the higher thing? Is that he's engaged in the great archangel Israfil, as we made mention in the hadith in, in of the Musnad of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, that saying that Israfil, he descends for three entire years. And he used to teach the Prophet ﷺ the word and the entity for three entire years. And that's all of the discrete stage. And thereafter we see, and the Prophet ﷺ in this stage, what's going to be important, that he will command, ultimately he's going to command the companions, those who do become Muslim, he will command them just to hit the hills in the same way he hits the hills, sallallahu Many of us as Muslims, that when we speak about Hira, the cave of Hira, that we have, this, we have this sort of erroneous understanding that the Prophet ﷺ was in Hira, 40 years of age, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, and he leaves Hira never to return. But the Prophet remains in Hira for over three years, over three years, he stays in Hira sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's where his engagements engagement with Israfil are. And then he commands the other companions, those who are becoming Muslim, yani through the da'wah of the Siddiq and others, that they likewise should, well, should go and hit the hills to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in solitude. And that's why we see one of the imams of the companions, whose name is Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Malik ibn Uhayb, ta'ala, and otherwise known as Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, ta'ala, and one of the ten people guaranteed paradise. And he said, I, was, I remember when I was one of three in Islam. See, that's, that's his memory of the religion. I was one of three. And he said, in those days, there was not even a single hair upon my chin. He said, he was a youth. When he became Muslim, Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And he was of those, and he mentions that I was of the first people to spill blood in Islam. He was the first one to spill blood in Mecca for the sake of Islam. And he was the first one to spill blood in Medina for the sake of Islam. As for Mecca, he recounts that the Prophet ﷺ had sent us into the hills. So we were worshipping in the hills of Mecca. And he says, when some of the disbelievers of Mecca passed by, and when they saw us worshipping Allah Ta'ala, they found it extremely strange. Us in the mountains, worshipping in a way that they were unfamiliar with. So they started to make what fun, fun of us. So Sayyidina Sa'ad said, so I took hold of the, of the skull of a camel and I just smashed it. Smashed this disbeliever over the head with the skull of a camel. And he said, that was the first blood that was spilt for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in Mecca. In the discrete stage, Sayyidina Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. One of those imams of the religion, when he went to what? He went to Kufa, to the city, the Iraqi city of Kufa. And Sayyidina Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the one who built the city of Kufa. There was no Kufa before Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. He built that southern city of Iraq. And when he becomes the governor of Kufa after building the city, that the people of Kufa begin to complain about Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Okay, they begin to complain that he doesn't know the religion and he doesn't know how to pray. The mafhum, the his sahaba, jaleel, ten guaranteed paradise, and he doesn't know the religion. Uh, when he's summoned by Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, Sayyidina Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala, and he says that these people are going to ya'sirunani, they're going to take me to account about religion. He said, if I don't know religion, there's no religion. 
خسرتو وخبتو he said it's all over if I do not know religion that's the Sahaba رضي الله تعالى ولا فخر they don't boast them about who they are they just what it's what's called they see the reality of who they are رضي الله تعالى وارضا then the open call which is the verbal stage and the verbal stage it it begins although there's an initial verbal stage at what three three years after hijra after after prophecy the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with mudathir that's method that's messengership and allah ta'ala reveals mudathir ya ayyuhal mudathir qum as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says oh the one who's enveloped wrapped in a cloak arise and warn and the other verse of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fasta' ma tu'mar then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleave open their forces with that which you've been commanded with they what signal they want the permission from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to go unto his people and to call his people unto islam okay and he will do it but he will not do it necessarily in a very challenging way to what is the dominant order it's to clarify but not necessarily to challenge and that challenge is going to come a lot later okay more so after the islam of sayyid umar ibn al-khattab that's when the challenge really begins okay the open call which is the third it was the third um, part of the of the prophetic call which is the first martial stage and we said the first martial stage that is going to begin when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam leaves mecca to medina okay allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to what is going to give the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the early people in in the very beginning it's only the people of mecca the muhajirun they're going to be given permission permission to engage the disbelievers of mecca with war with military in um, combat and then the open call which is the second martial stage and that's going to be just the last stage in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's um, mission is 23 year mission is that it's going to be at the 6th year after war after the hijra and that's going to be war it's going to be um, ushered in by the letters he begins to pen and write sallallahu alaihi wasallam ay on the hands of scribes unto the various kings of the world okay because that's the world stage now the universal messengership of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wasahbihi wasallam so we look at this briefly is the open call the verbal stage and as we see in surah al-hijr so openly expound what you have been commanded and turn away from the polytheists we will suffice you against those who ridicule okay and that's going to be important because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guarantee in safety and security for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in mecca but he's also warning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that it's not going to be easy also and what's going to be of the most amazing things we're going to see throughout mecca despite sahaba are being killed and tortured and expelled from mecca the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is still sleeping at the kaaba you see by himself you see and it is that surety that thiqa that certainty in the promise of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's untouchable sallallahu alaihi wasallam despite all of the pandemonium that is taking place in and around him and that also allah ta'ala alludes to the fact that there are going to be specific individuals those who ridicule ahlul istihza in sirah they're known as the mustahzi'un the mustahzi'un those who are going to go beyond just having a problem with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his mission but now they want to ridicule and make fun of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they're going to be an elite group of people ordinarily they're going to mention eight individuals who are called the mustahzi'un he'd walk past yatagamazun they would wink at each other and make fun of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells them in no uncertain terms jittukum bi dhabh i have come unto you with slaughter and he's speaking specifically about those who ridicule the messenger sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's words as they tell us inside the sciences of the law al ibra bi umum al lafz la bi khusus al sabab that we take into consideration the general import implication of the word not the particular reason or circumstances in which those words were uttered i those words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they resonate in our day and age and beyond for people who would take it upon themselves to ridicule the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wasallam if allah ta'ala in al bukhari in the hadith of abu huraira where he says man ada li waliyan faqad adhantuhu bil harb anybody who what shows enmity towards one i have befriended a wali then i declare war upon them that is the words of god allah jalla fil ula then what about the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam for those who take it upon themselves to ridicule or show enmity towards him jalla fil ula 
then their business is with God, okay? And he suffices in that regard. And warn your clan, your nearest relatives, and lower your wing to the believers that follow you. Then if they disobey you, then say, I will not be held responsible for what you do. Put your trust in the Almighty, the Merciful, who sees you when you stand and your movement in the company of those who bow. Surely he is the all-hearing, the all-knowing. So warn your clan, your nearest relatives. The Prophet ﷺ, in terms of his clan, here, and the dominant, as it's been translated here, it is two separate commandments here. One for him to warn his clan, and his clan is here, the Quraysh. Okay, that's who his clan is, is meant here by Quraysh. And likewise, to warn your nearest relatives, which here it means Banu Hashim. Okay, and we have to understand that these words, they're always relative. Because the Prophet Sallallahu in terms of tribe, it just depends on how far you want to take it back. Because in terms of tribe, he's an Adnani in terms of tribe. But then again, you could also call him a Mudari in terms of tribe. Or you could also call him a Kinani in terms of tribe. Or you could also call him a Qurayshi in terms of tribe. Or you could also call him in terms of he's from the tribe of Abd Manaf or the tribe of Hashim. So that there are different points by which you can say this is the tribe that has been mentioned of the Prophet ﷺ. But by what takes place, we know that it's been here, it's been spoken about, is the Quraysh. The Quraysh, i.e. the offspring of Fihr ibn Malik. Those who are, who are the children and progeny of Fihr ibn Malik, they're known as Quraysh, Quraysh. Okay? For different reasons, some say they're called Quraysh because they were traders, very astute traders. Because a Quraysh is like a what? It's a predatory beast of the sea. Some say a shark. Others say it was due to the fact that Fihr ibn Malik, when they used to take to the Red Sea, that this huge um, predatory um, sea animal would come out of Quraysh, known as a Quraysh in the language of the Arabs, which would make what? The Arabs scared and turn back to Arabia. Until what? When once it manifests, when Fihr ibn Malik is above on the boat, he takes a sword and he kills this actual Quraysh, this what, this sea creature, and that's why thereafter he becomes known as the Quraysh. Okay? As for what? Al Aqrabin. Al Aqrabin are the nearest relatives of the Prophet, and that is Banu Hashim. Likewise, it's going to be it's going to be manifest in what transpires. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wa sallam, here we see on the authority of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have never heard of a young Arabian man who has come unto his people with better than that which I have come unto you with. Verily I have came unto you with the best of the world and the hereafter. And what's going to be notable, come unto his people. Because there are stages in the call of the mess, as we alluded to, that in the initial period, he is calling his people, just as all of the other prophets call their people, as in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Prophets were always only sent to their people. That's why, yeah, call me. We say this words ultimately uttered inside the Quran, oh my people, on behalf of the prophets. Okay? The Prophet Sallallahu in the beginning of the affair, he likewise is sent to his people. The universality of his message will later manifest inside of Medina Tul Munawwara. Okay? I have never heard of a young Arabian man who has come unto his people better than that which I have come unto you with. Verily, I have came unto you with the best of the world in the hereafter. On the authority of Sa'id ibn Jubayr and the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, who said, when and warn your clan, your nearest relatives was revealed, the Prophet وسلم, ascended Mount Safa and began to proclaim, O tribe of Fihr, O clan of Adi, summoning all of the most prominent clans of Quraysh until they had all gathered. If a person was unable to attend, he would send a representative in his stead in order to see what was taking place. So Abu Lahab and the Quraysh attended. And this event is going to take place after the first event. Because the Prophet ﷺ, when the first verses are revealed, that the Prophet ﷺ, does the exact opposite. And they say this is part of the experience of prophecy that is known to the people of religion. That when the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first comes forth through the Prophet Sallallahu to go and warn his, his, his clan and his nearest relatives, rather than going to warn them, he goes into a state of recluse, locks himself inside of his house. 
And it is aunts, the daughters of Abdul Muttalib, they're the ones who begin to impress upon the Prophet Sallallahu like what is wrong with you? And the Prophet Sallallahu informs them about what has been revealed unto him. And they say, do what you've been commanded to do by your Lord. It's the daughters of Abdul Muttalib. Okay, do what they've, you've been commanded to do. And they say, so bring, and they, they advise the Prophet Sallallahu to bring all of Banu Hashim together. Because who is he going to bring first? Al-Aqrabun. Not the Quraysh, not what we're seeing here in the Hadith of Sa'id ibn Jubair. But here we're talking about he's bringing what his, tri his, his family members together, i.e. the family of his father, Abdullah, the Banu Hashim. And he's going to what? They advise him to make Farid, which is considered Sayyid al-Ta'am al-Farid, the Prophet Sallallahu says, the greatest dish, cuisine is Farid. So he cooks, he prepares Farid, and he calls everybody. But they tell him, be careful not to call our brother Abdul Uzza, i.e. Abu Lahab, because he will come with enmity. They knew their brother, and that's the brother of, that's the son of Abdul Muttalib, and they're the daughters of Abdul Muttalib, the uncle, and the aunts of the Prophet Sallallahu to which he complies, but Abu Lahab manifests and turns up. But we also know that he's not going to be exempt from the call, so he does turn up, and when the Prophet Sallallahu after they partake in that meal, and they say on that day, which tells us what the, the size of the tribe, that there were only 40 male members, adult members of what? Of Banu Hashim. I, that's the size of the tribe we're dealing with. It's Abu Lahab who stands and he says to bet this. For this reason, you want to make us a laughing stock. He says, may your hand perish, that's why you've called us. So he leaves. And that's what the first incident. What we're looking at here is the second incident. Where now it's what? Ashira. The Ashira of the tribe. Okay. And here the Prophet Sallallahu is going to go to Safa. And when the Prophet goes on Safa, and Safa, what was Safa known as? Safa was where all important announcements were announced, okay, inside of Mecca at Safa. So the Prophet goes to the place, and this is an important announcement. And he begins to call, O tribe of Fihr, Fihr ibn Malik, i.e. Quraysh. He's calling out the Quraysh, the various tribes of the Quraysh. Then he says, which in the hadith here, of Sa'id ibn Jubair, he only mentions, uh, he only mentions clan of Adi in this tradition, although the other tradition mentions some of the other clans. But what's really important about mentioning only clan of Adi, uh, what does this mean? Ayy Quraysh, Fihir ibn Malik, there are going to be 12 Butun, 12 tribes of the Quraysh, 12 different tribes of Quraysh, clans of Quraysh, we could call them. Okay? And of them is the clan of Adi. Okay? Why are they going to be singled out, the clan of Adi? Because the clan of Adi, they are the judges of, the, of Mecca. They're the ones who judge everything, the people of justice inside of Mecca. So they're going to be singled out that they need to be called because they're here to adjudicate the, the affair, truth or false. And obviously the great man of Adi, who's, who's a symbol of justice, is saying Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab is from the tribe of Adi. And Adi from Jahiliya were known as the people of justice and of brightness. Any, any quarrel inside of Mecca, any type of thing that needed to be adjudicated inside of Mecca, it was the tribe of Adi who would take on that responsibility. Okay, he addressed them saying, Were I to tell you that cavalry had gathered in the valley with the intention of conquering you, would you believe me? They replied, Yes, we have only ever heard you utter that which is true. He said, Verily, I am a warner sent unto you, a head lies a severe torment. Abu Lahab replies, and it's the second time he replies it, May you be wretched for the rest of the day, Tabet Yadak. Is this what you have called us here for? And thus Allah, i.e. reveals, perish the hands of Abu Lahab, and may he perish, his wealth avails him not, neither what he has earned was revealed, i.e. the verse of Abu Lahab was revealed those verses. Which are going to be important because it's the Quran, you haddi. The Quran is challenging Abu Lahab and the others. Because as the ulama say, all Abu Lahab needed to do to prove the erroneous quote unquote, the falsehood of the Quran, was just to become Muslim. That's all he had to do. Beginning Mecca, you see, three years after war, after prophecy, become a Muslim. And it proves that the Quran war is not true. But the Quran is true, obviously. And Abu Lahab, despite himself, was unable to become of those who prostrated unto Allah Ta'ala. Az-Zuhri, the Imam, 
of what of the generation that comes after the Sahaba, Muhammad ibn Shihab ad-Din al-Zuhri. He said, Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Okay, these are imams. Again, names. He we're still with the Prophet sallallahu but we have we have to move beyond the Prophet sallallahu to know him at a greater depth through understanding the Sahaba, and we likewise know the Prophet sallallahu at a greater depth through understanding the Tabi'een, and we know him at a greater depth. Through understanding Atba'a Tabi'een, those forms of generations that are the three great generations. Here are three of the greatest Imams ever for. If you had Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala and Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Dina Zuhri is the teacher of Imam Malik, the Imam of Medina in his time from Sikhara Tabi'een. Likewise, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, who is the Imam of Medina in his time. Nobody competed. Some consider him the greatest of all of that generation. He's one of the seven fuqaha of Medina. And he's the son-in-law of whom? Of Abu Huraira. He married the daughter of Abu Huraira. And then Abu Salama ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, the son of the great Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, one of the ten guaranteed paradise. Abu Salama is also one of the seven imams of Medina. They're called al fuqaha al-Saba'a, the seven great jurists of Medina. He's one of them alongside Sa'id ibn Musayyib. So they relate that they were informed that Abu Huraira said, their great teacher Abu Huraira, the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stood once and warned your clan, your nearest relatives, was revealed and said, O company of Quraysh, okay, or something similar to that. We've seen in the hadith of Sa'id ibn Jubair on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas, that it was, O tribe of Fihr. And we said they're both synonyms. Sell your souls, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, to whom? To Allah. Okay, that Allah ishtara min al mu'mineen and fusahum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bought from the believers their souls. Sell your souls to Allah ta'ala. I cannot suffice you in front of God. O clan of Abd Manaf. Whose clan of Abd Manaf? His clan. That's the clan of the Prophet Islam from the 12 Batoon of Quraysh, the 12 clans of Quraysh. Abd Manaf is the great, great grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu He is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib. The son of Hashim, the son of Abd Manaf. That's Abd Manaf. The great grand, great great grandfather of the Prophet. I cannot suffice you in front of God. So he's went from moving from Quraysh, his larger tribe, to his war, his clan, the clan of Abd Manaf. And from the tribe of Abd Manaf, O oh Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Who does this represent? The uncles, the men of, ba- of Banu Hashim. O oh Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, I cannot suffice you in front of God. O oh, Sophia, who is Sophia? The daughters, she's, she's, she's going to represent the daughters of Abdul Muttalib. Sophia, the mother of Zubair ibn Awam, paternal unto the messenger of God, وسلم, I cannot suffice you in front of God. And from them to his daughter, told you even progeny, O oh, Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, وسلم, ask for whatever you want for my wealth, but I cannot suffice you in front of God. Everybody is being warned. Okay, every single one who is present is being warned. And obviously this is going to war, it's going to bring about retribution against the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But initially, and that's why it's important to understand something about what traditional Arabian society, that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi is going to be untouchable because he's an aristocrat, he's blue blood Qurayshi, in Mecca, the tribe of Abd Manat, they're untouchables. So what is going to happen initially, that Quraysh are going to look for what? The weak from amongst those who follow the Prophet ﷺ. Because in general, who's following the Messenger of Allah ﷺ? One, youth. The youth, that's very important. But you, all of the Sahaba who become Muslim in that formative period are youth. And by, when I say youth, I mean Dun al Ishreen, beneath 20 years of age. That is, that is very clear. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, When I came with this mission, Kadhabani Shayukh. He said, The elders denied me. But it was the youth who took on my mission, the Prophet ﷺ said, first and foremost. Then the second are between what we call Mawali and Ariqa. Mawali are former slaves, and Ariqa are those who are what, in bondage inside of Meccan society. They're the initial people who follow the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, and the elders, power brokers in society, are going to reap havoc upon all of them three categories. After the youth, then they're going to be ostracized, some of them in prison, like Sayyidina Mus'ab ibn Umair, not allowed to leave their house. Sayyidina Mus'ab, the youth of Quraysh, teenager, who was the most f- finest dressed, 
I'm the most handsome of all of the Quraysh. He said he was a dead ringer facially for the Prophet Muhammad Sayyidina Mus'ab ibn Umayr, the one who was killed, martyred at the Battle of Uhud. Okay, never did he wear the same clothes twice, Sayyidina Mus'ab. You knew where he went in the streets of Mecca by virtue of the great perfume that he would wear, Sayyidina Mus'ab, because his mother was extremely wealthy. But when he proclaimed Islam, khalas, she imprisoned Sayyidina Mus'ab ibn Umayr imprisoned him, wasn't allowed to go out. I mean, see, that would be common with others of the youths. As for the Mawali and the Ariqa, they're going to be tortured, symbolized in the likes of whom? Sayyidina Bilal al-Habishi. Symbolized in the likes of whom? The mother of Sayyidina Bilal al-Habishi. Symbolized in the likes of whom? Al-Yasir, the family of Ammar ibn Yasir, father, mother, and son, all of them tortured for the sake of Allah. Father, martyred, mother, martyred. He has to what? He has to lie in order to save his life, Sayyidina Ammar radiallahu ta'ala. Because these are what are riqa, yani the lowest echelons of that type of very, very structured um, tribal society. But we see this as common, and you see this as a theme throughout the Quran, the weak and the oppressed. They're the ones who follow the prophets. As we asked, as in, in Hadith al-Bukhari of Caesar, when Caesar asks whom, he asks Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan, this is towards the end of, end of prophecy, who follows this man who claims prophecy? Hercules, the first or the second, people dispute. And who follows this man who claims prophecy? And, they, and is it the aristocrats? Or is it what? The, the weak, the oppressed, the low lives in society? And Abu Sufyan thinks, oh, now no, it's not the aristocrats, it's the low life. Because he thinks that's going against the Prophet. And later on, Caesar answers every question. Why ask the question? And he says, When you told me it was the low life, he said, Kavali Kalanbiya. That's the nature of prophets. They're never followed by aristocrats, by the leaders of society. They're always followed by the downtrodden, the oppressed inside of society. The nature of what? Of Deen al-Islam. Deen al-Islam liberates. When we look at the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa arda, that the great city of Islam, the citadel of Islam, was Medina al munawwara It's the city in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa dies Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and is buried, and likewise Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar ibn al Khattab and Uthman ibn Affan, and 10,000 companions were buried inside of that city of the 124,000 companions. The rest, they fled to the four corners of what we now know as the Islamic war, the Islamic world, because they built that world. That was a world that was built by one generation, by and large, the generation of the Sahaba. Okay, what we see is an amazing reality of, the, of those people that when they engage every single society, that they emancipate the downtrodden and the oppressed, such that we see in the first generation who are called the Tabi'een, the Tabi'een, when we look at all of the citadels of Islam, from Sana'a to Kufa to Basra to Baghdad to Damascus to Cairo, for start, all of the citadels, including Mecca, with the exception of Medina to Munawwara, the Imams of all of those cities were slaves, Mawali, who were emancipated and then became the greatest people in that society. One generation, the Tabi'een, Imam Hassan al Basri, Imam al Tawus, you can go through them, Imam Imam al Khurasani. One by one, every single city, and it was what was, was, was the Imams of those cities were slaves, emancipated, educated. They become the ones who hold what become the pillars of religion inside of that society. That is an amazing testament to the reality of what jittukum li ukhrijukum min ibadat al ibad ila ibadati rabb al ibad. I've come unto you to take you out of the worship of what of slaves, yani unto the worship of the Lord of slaves. Okay, that's what our first generation did. And we've always got to ask because this, you know, studying history, the human being as a um, Vico once said, he said, the human being, is history is an essential part of our identity, of who we are. But unfortunately, we as Muslims, as a generation, we have divorced ourselves from history. I, history no longer informs our identity, no longer informs who we are. No, we study Sira or the great Imams of the religion, that's supposed to inform who we are, how we tread the earth, how we deal with the societies in which we reside. And when we look at Islam and we look at the Muslims in our day and age, it is pitiful. At the best opinion, having a good opinion of our reality, we are in a very, very pitiful state. But it's not Islam abstract. It's us. 
as individuals, because Islam is as good as its adherents, straight up, okay? But the chiefs of those of his people who scoffed said, we see you as nothing more than a human being like ourselves, and we do not see anyone following you but those who are the most abject of us, primitive in their judgment, badly or rotty, like stupid people. We do not see you as having any virtue superior to us. On the contrary, we consider you liars. That's a theme you see against Hud, a theme you see against Sayyidina Nuh, alayhi salam, a theme you see against the other prophets, Moses and others, the downtrodden, the oppressed, badly or rotty, stupid individuals who will follow these so-called prophets, so-called righteous folk, purified folks, as they say to Lot and his people. And the Prophet ﷺ has the same type of followers, same type of followers, which causes the aristocrats, it gives them a good reason not to become Muslim. Like Abu Sufyan says, when he sees them, Bilal and Suhaib al-Rumi and Salman al-Farisi, after Hijrah, when he sees them sitting in a gathering, discussing knowledge, it's like, you want me to sit amongst them? How <laughs> about Bilal al-Habashi? Sahib al Rumi, Salman al Farisi, you know, slaves, former slaves. I'm supposed to what, rub shoulders with them, Abu Sufyan. Uh, and we caused the people that fought weak to inherit the land of the East and the West, which we have blessed. And the good word of your Lord was fulfilled for the Israelites because they endured patiently. Okay, Banu Israel, who were slaves in what? In Egypt. The chiefs amongst the people who were conceited said to those considered powerless, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, istud'ifu. And istud'ifu in the Arabic language, it's beautiful how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it, istud'ifu. Istud'ifu, istud'ifu to those, to, to those among them who believed, do you know Salih to be an emissary from the Lord Ida with? Istud'af in the Arabic language is the perception of weakness. That's what it means. It doesn't mean those who are weak. It means those who are perceived to be weak. And that's why Allah, the chiefs amongst his people, okay, Saleh, this is Qawm Thamud, who were conceited, said to those who they perceived to be powerless, perceived to be weak in society, but they're not weak. And history is going to dictate, well, it's Al-Aqibah al the end of it is for those, is for whom? Those who are, who are conscious of Allah, Jalla al -Ula. so it's a perception of weakness. Look at them when they go to Badr and they see what the army of the Prophet وسلم, they see a ragtag army, Quraysh with all of their fine armor and their fine steel and their fine cavalry and their fine horses and their fine camels and their great food and the party they brought along and then they see the, they see the army of the Prophet وسلم, which they consider ragtag, 313 individuals, you only have one horse, say the Miqdad ibn Aswad, one horse they have. And they look at the sword, and, and who made those swords? What are they going to do? And Abu Jahal, Amr ibn Hisham, who's the general of the army on that day, he says, fight. He says, let's get some rope, tie them up, and just drag them back to Mecca. Ragtag army, there's no war today. Perception of weakness. And then they routed. Uh, where was weakness on that day? Yawm il taqal jam'an. Look what Allah calls it, the day when the two great armies met. Well, where was the greatness of the 313? It wasn't external greatness. It was internal greatness. The reality of where their connection was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why when one of the war, one of the, the, the reconnaissance of the Quraysh, he sent to go and look the army that's coming. And he goes and he what? He rides around the army. He rides looking at the, at the army of the prophets, riding around, doesn't engage them. And then he goes back. And then they say, what do you say? He says, few in numbers, roughly 300. You get, you get to the point, roughly 300 people just by gazing at them. He could count them like that. Th roughly 300 people. He said, what do you say? I advise we turn back, we don't fight. He says, why? He says, any people who come out looking like that for war, there's something beyond what you see. He says, go back, don't fight these people. See, he recognized the reconnaissance there, and Abu Jahl gets mad. What do you mean, go back? And that's when he goes, and when he sees them, he says, rag tag, tie them up with rope, we'll drag them back to Mecca. Okay, and they were routed. The reality of where strength lies, and that again should inform our identity, because we are what one of our weaknesses, right? power for us is the same place where the disbelievers, the kuffar, place power in the outward. That's where we perceive power. We perceive power in wealth. 
We see we perceive family and whatever, yani, blood lineage that we may have that Allah Ta'ala has supposedly preferred us with or not preferred us with. We see it in the positions that we hold, the houses that we have, the cars that we drive, in the clubs that we belong to, or the political party that we may support. We place the same value that the disbelievers place upon life. We're in Al-Aish, Al-Aish, Al-Akhirah. That what? The life is the life of the year after, the other world. That's where the value is placed. And you would not find one Imam of the Sahaba, and we would say any of the Sahaba, who disagreed with that point, they understood Izza, that what might Lillah is for God, Wali Rasulihi and His Messenger, Walil Mu'minin, and for the believers. And that Izza doesn't come by placing value upon this world, because this world means nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing. But it comes through place and value upon the world that is eternal and never ceases. Okay? Harm's way. Do you think that you will be left alone as long as they say we believe without their being tried? We did indeed try those before them and God knows who were the truthful and does indeed know those who were false likewise. So quit complaining. You see, don't complain. Let's not build movements that are called movements against Islamophobia. Quit complaining and just fortify your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's all part of the test of faith. You see, the believers are crafted in the fairness of the dunya, in the difficulty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaps upon what those believers, liyumahis, so that he may know those who are amongst us who are pure and truthful to his cause, and those who are just liars and just what, blaggers as they will say, for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they were tried, and in Mecca, because where's the standard? It's not what I say, the standard is inside of Mecca. And when they come, as we see in the hadith of Khabab ibn Arrat, they come to the Prophet in Sahih al-Bukhari at the Kaaba, when he's sitting in the midst of all of this pandemonium, and they don't really even complaining. Just, Ya Rasulullah, just make dua that Allah lifts this to dua. It wasn't necessarily a direct complaint. He sits up, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ihmarra wajhu, and his face turns color, and he gets extremely angry, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, there were those who went before you, a people, and he was speaking of the people of the Yemen, people of Tawheed in the Yemen, who when they declared belief, they would be taken and a saw would be placed on their foot, on the top of their head, and they would be sawn into two. We don't know that in Abu Ghuraib. We don't know that in Guantanamo Bay, as foul as that is, the reality of what people are doing to people of belief, as foul as that is, never mind people of belief, people, human beings, Banu Adam is a respected creature, how could somebody do this? But worse has gone before for people who follow the monotheistic path. So quit complaining and allow your heart to attach to the Lord of all being and understand the al-aqibah lil-muttaqeen, the end of fear is for the people of faith. You doubt Allah Ta'ala. You doubt the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wallah, he said, by Allah, let you tim have that amr. That he will complete this affair. Until a rider can go, he said, from Sana'a to Hadramaut, fearing nothing, even a wolf upon his sheep. He said, but as for you, Antum, qawmun to sta'jilun. You're a hasty people. Not an ounce of patience inside of you. Huh. Sahaba, they're being killed, taught and expelled, and he still calls them hasty. You're not people of patience. And then what's what? What have we gone through? What have we gone through? The Prophet said, Prophets are tried the most, then those who resemble them most, and those who resemble them most. The Prophet says, When any affliction afflicts you, remember me. That's all he says. Draw comfort in your affliction through me. Because there's nothing that we're going to face, except the Prophet Sallallahu faced it. And his life, you know, they have, the Greeks have the genre of tragedy. The Prophet Sallallahu life is tragedy in that sense. It's a very difficult life, difficult life. And a person is born without a father. And he can, if we talk about normative sense, barely remember his mother. In, in normative sense, somebody's mother dies at six years of age. Grandfather, eight years of age, buries every single one 
of his what? Of his children. Coaches, I went to a, a Janaza recently and somebody had passed. I would ask him, like, where's the father of the deceased? He said, well, in this culture, the fathers, like the parents, they never bury their children. They could never attend the janaza of what? Of their children. And it just that's how it is culturally. It's too difficult for them to become a cultural stance that they have. And the prophets are buried in every one of his children except one. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A culture refuses to bury their children because of the pain of seeing your child go before you. Yet the Prophet Sallallahu of six children, five of them are buried on his own hands. Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. And he ridiculed, expelled from the land in which he was born. Companions killed, attempted to be killed. Dominant opinion, poison, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at his life. And then we have just a small thing that goes wrong in our life. And then qamat dunya wa qa'adat. That khalas, the whole world turns upside down inside of our lives. That's the believers of this day and age. Welcome to Islam. On the authority of Abdul, authority of Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, who said once, whilst the Prophet ﷺ was praying in the surroundings of Ismail, a Hijrat al-Ismail, Uqba ibn Abu Ma'it, he's one of the what, the eight mustahzi, appeared suddenly and placed his garment around the Prophet ﷺ and began to violently strangle him. So he took hold of the Prophet and he's trying to strangle the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu So Abu Bakr came forth and took hold of his shoulder and pushed him away from the Prophet Sallallahu and said, Will you kill a man because he says, God is my Lord? You see, why are you attacking him? But the beauty of that, the subtlety that the Prophet Sallallahu in the Shema'il is reported that he has the strength of 40 men. And we've seen, yeah, he could have easily disarmed Uqba ibn Mu'it and strangled him with his own garment. Yet the Prophet Sallallahu chose to suffer Sallallahu Alaihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallama. And in that there are lessons for people who take to the way of Mecca. On the authority of Khabbab ibn Arrat, the hadith we mentioned, who said, I went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and found him reclining upon his cloak in the shade of the Kaaba at a time when we were undergoing severe trials at the hands of the idolaters. But there's the Prophet maxing and relaxing in the shade of the Kaaba. So I asked him, will you not pray to God for us? So he sat up whilst his face became red and said there were those prior to you would have, who would have their bones stripped of nerves and flesh by an iron comb. But that what, but that, what not, but that would not, that would not make them swear from their religion. God will indeed complete this affair so that our rider will travel from Sana'a to Hadramot, fearing none but God and a wolf in relation to his flock. For well, verily you are a hasty people. If only you were to leave for Abyssinia, and this becomes what the next stage in what in terms of the what the difficulties of what that they're experiencing inside of Mecca in the formative period, calling unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what's important about this when we look at numbers, so you gotta we get a, a sense of how many people are around the Prophet Sallallahu we're still way beneath forty people who are following the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahi wa sallama. Okay, because the critical quote-unquote mass, ten of quote-unquote fortunes in Islam, is in the fifth year, approaching sixth year of the Hijrah, in the Islam of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Umar ibn al-Khattab. Hamza is the 39th Muslim, and Umar is the 40th Muslim. Okay, so at this point we're still dealing with very few numbers, in terms of male, and when I mean Muslim, I mean male Muslim men, okay? Although no doubt there are, there are a great number of women who are also a Muslim at this point in time. So the Prophet ﷺ is going to command the companions now to leave for war for Abyssinia. Leave for Abyssinia. The weak ones, and if you look, it's those who are weak and vulnerable. They're going to leave. But also he's going to send some of the imams of the companions who are not weak and vulnerable Okay, but well, again, that's an allusion to leadership. As the Prophet ﷺ said, "Imma min al Quraysh, ala imma min al Quraysh." The leaders are from the Quraysh. So the likes of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, who's Qurayshi, Umawi, Umawi on his father's side, is Hashemi on his mother's side. He's going to be sent to war to lead the believers unto war unto um, Abyssinia, and then in the second migration, which is going to follow um, after Umar ibn Khattab's Islam. Then it's going to be what? Ja'far ibn Abi Talib is going to be sent 
Likewise, Qurayshi to lead well, those who are finding it too difficult inside of Mecca. Okay, if you understand Arabia, that the Hijazis, the Hijazis who, destro- who are very strong influence in Hijazi culture comes from beyond the Red Sea. And the Red Sea was their natural get out point in what's called the Hijaz. The Hijaz, which is Western Arabia, it is a part of Arabia that is fortified, blocked off in one sense from the rest of Arabia. That's why it's called the Hijaz. Okay, and that's why when we study Sirah, we see that Allah Ta'ala knows best where he places his message. And where did he place his message? In a fortress which was Arabia, in a fortress which was the Hijaz, in a fortress which was Mecca, mountainous city, and thereafter Medina, the city that's surrounded by angels. Okay, so here, so but every fortress has a back door. And the back door for the Hijazis was the Red Sea. Hit the port, Red Sea, get to Abyssinia. That was the back, that was safe passage for them. Because we always have to ask questions, Mafum and Mukhalifa, why not Yemen? Why not Sham? Why not Najd? Why not Iraq? Why not Arud? Why not the other various parts of Arabia where the Prophet Sallallahu be sent to or send the early companions to? No, he sends it where the Arabians of the Hijaz are accustomed to go for safe passage, which is always Abyssinia. If you were to, if you, if only you were to leave for Abyssinia, as therein lies a king in front of whom none is oppressed. It is a land of truth until God relieves you of what has befallen you. So the companions are going to leave. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa arda. Yani several of the companions are going to leave. Okay, oh, out for Abyssinia, and one of the things we see, which again shows us. The nature of someone like Umar ibn al-Khattab, who really is very a very complex being, because Umar ibn al-Khattab, of the families who were leaving, they were families he used to torture. And Umar was a torturer in Jahiliya. He did great harm to the believers. He used to beat, quote-unquote, till he was tired, the mother of whom? Of Bilal. And the torture of the mother of Bilal was Umar ibn al-Khattab in Jahiliya. And in the riwayah, he used to beat her, and Umar ibn Khattab, if you, know, if, you, if you know his biography, Umar ibn Khattab is a man who is in excess of seven foot in height, huge in height, saying Umar ibn Khattab. He's known as Ahlul Takhtid in Mukhattatun, the people of Mukhattat, the Mukhattatun. They were those from the Quraysh who, when they sat on a camel or a horse, their feet would touch the ground. That's how tall they were. Then they would tell the camel to move or the horse. And their feet would draw lines in the sun. That's what they call the Mukhattatun, the ones who draw lines in the sun. But amongst them was Umar ibn Khattab, they report on Hajj. When you, when you went to Hajj and you saw people doing Tawaf, you would just see this head towering above everybody else. And it was the head of Umar ibn Khattab, huge person in stature. And he would take the mother of Bilal and he would beat her senseless. Well, senseless, i.e. he got sort of tired and then he would sit down. And she would say, is that it? Is that all you can give? And she's trying to make her reject faith. She was a slave likewise. And he, she's, that nothing Umar could do to the mother of Bilal al-Habashi that would make her turn on faith, the resilience of these early believers. And there was another family of saying Umar al-Khattab used to torture. And then Umar ibn al-Khattab, he sees them one day and they're packing their bags. And the husband is left. And he says that, she sa- he says, are you leaving, Umar says? And she says, yes, because of the harm you and your people have done unto us. And to which Umar ibn al-Khattab says, may God be with you. This is in his jahiliya. And then when her husband returns, she says that, the, she says that Umar ibn al-Khattab came. And she mentioned what had happened. She said, I believe that his heart may have softened. And her husband says that what are you? Believe, it's as if you believe he will become Muslim, Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he says, by Allah, the donkey of al-Khattab will become Muslim before he does. And that's how they understood Umar. There's no way he can become Muslim, a torturer, a torturer. And they eventually leave. And by the time they return, saying Umar ibn al-Khattab is Muslim by the time they return. And this is what a sign of who's in charge. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala, we have to be next class, we go into the noble virtues of Karatba, which is inshallah ta'ala, the theme of Mecca, inshallah. Anyone have any questions, inshallah ta'ala? Any questions? You, you mentioned uh, the number 313 keeps on coming up in, in our history. And I heard that the 
a number of people who will be following Imam Mahdi will be 313. Does that mean that there will be no other um, virtuous Muslims um, around at that time, or is that just the people uh, with him uh, in his vicinity, Muslims? Allah Ta'ala Alam, with the number being applied to Imam Mahdi, it's, it's, it's definitely not something that is affirmed in um, traditions in terms of the number around Imam Mahdi. But what, what is affirmed in traditions, but some of them are, are, are weak, is that, that there's going to be you know, elites around the Mahdi, okay, elites. And, and the words are used like the Nujaba and what have you in the tradition of the Prophet So they are all sort of elite people. I, the point I'm saying, Allah Ta'ala is the number 13, but what would that allude to? It would allude to elite people. Do you understand? It's like the Prophet <laughs> he has a lot of companions, what are called Sahaba, but there are elite companions who are those, they're called the Hawariyun. So when we speak about Jesus, for instance, we call the disciples the Hawariyun. Now, do we believe that Jesus only had 12 followers? No. You understand? He had 12 followers. You know, the Christians, he had 12 disciples. So only 12 people follow Jesus. No. So the Hawariyun, what's understood in our time, the Hawariyun are the elite followers of any prophet or any messenger. So the prophet says in the tradition, he said, every prophet has Hawariyun. Every prophet has these Hawaris, these what we call disciples in English. And he said, from my Hawariyun is Zubair ibn Awam. Okay, Zubair, one of the, the ten, the, the son of Sophia. Okay, that he, that he is one of the ten guaranteed paradise. So he's a Hawari. So the point we would, we would extend that to the Imam Mahdi of himself, and traditions affirm that, that there are people like Hawariyun, elect, who are around them. If that number applies, it would apply to them, not to his followers, because he has a great amount of followers. The Mahdi comes from, from leadership. Hey, the Mahdi doesn't, just, he doesn't pop up. The Mahdi is the Mahdi is somebody who holds down polity. He's a ruler of Islamic society. The Muslim of Muhammad ibn Hanbal. Okay, so it's not, he doesn't have 313 followers. He has armies behind him. And at the beginning of his reign is all war. Those armies fighting on his behalf. Yeah. And the other question was, um, he talked about uh, the Mawali and the uh, Riqa and except in the message of the Prophet ﷺ. And then you also mentioned the youth. What was it? What's, what is it about the youth that they were more receptive than the shiukh? The, what, what was what, it? What, call it what, what is it? Why is it that they uh, were open to the message more than the, the senior people? Yeah, there are several reasons. From the most, one of the most important reasons was the Prophet ﷺ as an exemplar in society. And his example is mentioned in Syria. His example was so profound in society that the Quraysh, notably the Quraysh, saw him as the best person for their children to be amongst. It's the irony of it. Mm -hmm. So they would watch, send their children to be around the Prophet And when you're in the midst of the Prophet you're in the midst of somebody who has disdain for that society. That was, yani, pre-40 confirms that. The Prophet, the people, the only men you would see around the Prophet men, and he was, often, he was more so a recluse, but the only men were Hunafa. People who hated society and hated polytheism, like Zayd bin Amr bin Nawfal, like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and others. Okay, they were those type of people. So the youth who were then sent to be in the company of the Prophet and khalas. And that's what really does prepare them. And then you could just also go into the war, you know what I mean? The rebellious teens. It's not something that manifests in Western society alone, but it's something that all cultures have that war, rebellious teens. And that's part of it. And the Prophet or the companions, they quote unquote played that to their advantage. That that was just a sign of their rebellion against society, but it was a beautiful rebellion. As the Hunafa are the way the Hunafa, we could translate we mentioned it before, we can translate it in many ways, but the Hunafa, one of the ways you could translate it literally, are rebels. Those who rebel against the dominant order. No. Questions, inshallah. When you're saying that Hamza uh, Muslim number 39 and then Umar was the 40th. Oh, well. Did you say that in the counting only men are counted? And yeah, usually, yeah. yeah when, when, they, when they count, they usually only speak about the men. Because the reason that the men are going to be known, definitely known, and a lot of the women, although they may be Muslim, they may hide their faith, but the men are going to be known. They're the ones who are ultimately in and around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, either in Dal Arqam or in Dar al Sa'id. So the men are going to be known, yeah. So the, the, 40, the number 40 for Umar would not uh, have. 
Khadija Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't include Khadija or the other the, the the women from amongst the Sahaba. Speaking about the men. Uh, Could you also just uh, because that's Arabia, the same way when we spoke about Safa, about the, the first meeting at, 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 in, at Banu Hashim, they mentioned the books of Sarah, 40 men. There was only 40 men of Banu Hashim at that point in time. So again, that's how society was very sort of a, a patriarchal society, where and it, still to this day when we speak about what Islam is where the, the 10 guaranteed paradise, what it's all men, what no women guaranteed paradise. It's just, it's just, and it, because Islam, and the ordinary, which carries on the sort of Arabian way, it sort of places women beyond the veil, and it, for various reasons, a lot of them noble. No. Well, the hadith that you mentioned, uh, and then uh, you quoted Anas was saying that the prophecy was at the age of 40. No. So, how do we, I mean, what is the Aqidah of Ali Sunnah and Jama'ah and how do we sort of bring the two together? Yani aqida, in terms of aqida, in the Kuntu Nabin or Adam Bain al Ma'i Wateen, that would not enter into the sphere of aqida. And we have to be very sort of yani, be clear about that in that aqida must be substantiated on adillat al qata'iyah, must be established upon a hadith or, or, or verses in the Quran that are wa qata'i al wurud, qata'i al dalala, yani absolute. Not open, not open for what for doubt. Okay, the hadith of Kuntu Nabi and Adam Bain al Ma'i, Yani Bain al Ma'i, the various rewires, they don't reach the, 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 the level of Qata'iyah. So we wouldn't enter that into, into what? Into Aqidah. That's why you would never study that in a book of Aqidah. Okay, but as for the Prophet وسلم, being four, at 40 years of age, yes, yani, I, that would be what? Yani Mutawatir bil Ma'ana. Too many traditions that allude to the fact that it's our 40 years of age, the message was granted to the Prophet ﷺ. No doubt the Aqidah and the Sunnah wa Jama'ah is upon that. Okay? So, I mean, I'm only saying that your Tumma Aqidah here is going to be strict in the sense of the word Aqidah, that our belief is that the Prophet ﷺ was granted prophecy at 40 years of age. I, that's all that really matters. Because why, when we speak about the world of souls, you know, that, you know how that matters? When you are a spiritual being, it matters then. When that is not something that's understood by this, it's something that's understood by that. Okay? So long as that's not the case, and by and large, 99% of the Muslims, it's not going to be the case, then khalas, it's not necessarily an issue we should dwell upon. Okay? 